Today I'm going to be talking about uh, cryptographic data structures. This is work that I did with a graduate student of mine named Scott Crosby. Uh, this work was largely 2007, 2008, 2009. So seven years old, therefore it's obsolete and nobody cares, right? Well, not really. So earlier today and earlier days, Bart Perniel has been telling you about um, building protocols and using cryptographic primitives and how different primitives have various weaknesses. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm going to be assuming that hash functions are ideal, that one cannot break a hash function, that hash functions are perfect. And with these perfect hash functions, which of course don't exist in reality, we're going to talk about things that you can build using those beautiful and perfect hash functions. I'm not going to be talking about specific applications. I know that many of you might be excited about Bitcoin. I'm not going to spend much of any time talking about Bitcoin, mostly because I think it's a bad idea for a hundred different reasons. Instead, I'm going to be talking about I'm not going to talk about other applications of these technologies either, like certificate revocation structures, voting machine, public bulletin boards. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about these low-level primitive data structures that you can build that have applications for those areas. So by the end of this talk, you should be able to look at the design of something like the Bitcoin blockchain or certificate revocation lists, and you should be able to say, I understand that design now. Or, I think that design is crazy, one or the other. That's, that, that's the purpose of today's talk. Okay, so here's the problem. We have computers out there in the cloud, and we don't trust them. We don't know who runs them, we don't know if they're evil, but they're storing our data. And that could be backups, that could be blogs and publication services, or we might be storing a database in the cloud. Or for that matter, I'm running a large organization and I need to store my logs and other forensic data and I'm worried that an attacker might try to compromise my logs or compromise my forensic data. So it's very important for me to preserve the integrity of my data. Of course, that could be hackers who are trying to mess with the integrity of my data. So for now, I'm not worried about privacy at all. Not my problem. We're not worried about privacy. We're only worried about integrity. We're going to see if we can solve just that problem and what that would mean. So when we're in a world where potentially hostile servers are storing our data, we cannot prevent them from changing the data. We cannot prevent hackers from deleting or overwriting data. But at least we can detect that our data is correct. So we're not trying to be tamper resistant, we're trying to be tamper evident. We would like to have very strong evidence that our data is correct or have a strong proof that it's not. That's the goal. And we'd like to do that efficiently and securely. Okay? So I hope I've, I'm trying to narrow it down to a very specific set of problems that I think we can, we can do something about. People have been publishing designs like this forever. Uh, Ralph Merkel did Merkel trees, which are a tree-shaped structure in 1988. <coughs> Half of you aren't even that old yet, which is kind of sad. I feel old now. Um, digital signatures have been around forever, and that, per that lets you verify the integrity of a specific object. And there have been a lot of other uh, structures. Uh, Kelsey and Schneier built a, a, a hash chain, like sort of a linked list. There have been a whole bunch of people building things that are called authenticated dictionaries. Some people have been working on hierarchical documents. But let's, let's focus in on, on the first one, logging. So my model is I have servers that I basically don't trust. And I want to be able to, you know, I mean, sorry, I have clients I don't really trust, I have a server I don't really trust, and, but I do have auditors, and them I do trust. And the auditors are trying to make sure that the log 
today is consistent with the log yesterday that nothing that no nothing is no funny business has gone on. So if you're into Bitcoin, you might think of these auditors as the miners, the Bitcoin miners. But their goal is to detect tampering or say looks good. You can imagine using this in Bitcoin. Uh, people, cryptographers have been excited about using these for election results. Every electronic voting paper talks about having a public bulletin board. This is how you might build one. Or imagine you just want to use this for storing your syslogs and any other kind of log data that any company might generate. A different sort of problem you might want to solve are what are called variations on authenticated dictionaries. So, now we have some kind of a trusted author that's publishing a dictionary. So a dictionary just means keys and values. Some mapping from keys, which are strings, to values, which are strings. And those strings could be anything, I don't care. Again, we want to store it on untrusted servers, and clients need to be able to fetch. They want to make queries to this dictionary, and they want to get correct answers that they can verify. And what can you use a key value state to store for? Almost anything. If something like DNS or any other database, certificate revocation lists, price lists. You, know, you could store all kinds of things in key value data stores. Incredibly general purpose. So in our research, we looked at both the you know, two different kinds of structures. We looked at structures for maintaining histories and logs, and we looked at structures for maintaining dictionaries. And we, we made them faster, and we made and all of our code is online. So you can take our bit built in a, a mix of Python and C, C++. So you can you know, don't take it from me, take it from my code. All right. First things first, let's talk about tamper evident logging. So logs are everywhere, various national regulations have lots of requirements that I'm blissfully unaware of. Uh, if I had to study Sarbanes-Oxley, I would probably sooner like, drive a spike through my head. But everybody needs to maintain logs and data. And right now, if you go to a big security conference like RSA, what you will see is vendors who sell these trusted hardware boxes. So they implement an abstraction of a log that is append only. But that, that abstraction is maintained by you trust the operating system and you trust the application running in this box. And the box has an Ethernet jack, and you send it syslog messages or whatever, and it records them. And you trust that this large software stack will maintain the integrity of the log that's being stored on a completely ordinary hard drive inside the computer. Many companies will sell you these devices, and they have big, beautiful booths with lots of paper they'll hand you telling you how awesome they are. We would like to be able to make, to take all the trust out of a box like that, where you could store, the, the hard drives could be anywhere, in Amazon, it doesn't matter, where the goal is just to be able to detect tampering. And we would like, the, not only that, imagine that we're outsourcing this to Amazon, we want to find a way that Amazon has to prove to us that they didn't cheat that they can generate proofs that we can verify cheaply, and those proofs are convincing to us that they didn't do anything bad, and we want to make it fast. So, I'm about to be giving you lots of performance numbers. Keep in mind, this is on a Core 2 Duo <laughs> Mac Mini in 2007. So modern computers are much, much, much faster than this. Nonetheless, we could still go really fast on this old crappy computer. So, for, for, we built a system that we're, we're calling a history tree. Every operation you could care about, inserting, verifying, they're all logarithmic in the size of the tree, whereas these hash chains are linear, and that linear is, is bad. Um, we could um, insert like almost 2,000 events per second on a slow, crappy computer, and we could audit 8,000 events per second on a slow, crappy computer. Modern computers, you can probably add at least another zero onto this. And we tried to think really hard about the threat model and about 
the importance of auditing, which is often left out of these discussions. So first, let's zero in on the threat model. What exactly? Who is trying to accomplish what? So we're potentially concerned about an insider who can, who can overwrite any hard drive, um, and in fact, the logger and the administrator might both be evil, and they might all want to change history. And changing history is bad. Was it Stalin who said that the victor gets to write history? We want to make that not possible. So there's been a lot of security effort on what's called forward integrity or perfect forward secrecy, which basically means that everything is good up until the moment you get compromised, and then you have no guarantees. But the attacker can't change the past. So we want to perhaps be even better than that. So here's our design. We have a logger. When you see logger, you might think Amazon EC2. It doesn't really matter. This is, this, is, this is a thing that maintains hard drives. It's going to store our events. We don't trust it at all. And then we have clients. Clients are the things that create events they wish to be logged. This is your network of Unix boxes generating syslog events. And we want to obviously the, the computer that's creating the event to be logged is trusted at the instant that it creates that one event. If you're going to make up an event and then log it, I can't stop you. But once you've logged it, you shouldn't be able to rewind and change your opinion about something you've said in the past. And then we would like so then we're going to invent a third kind of party we're going to call an auditor. And the auditor's job is to verify that the system is correct and the clients will sort of leak them information that says by the way I just did something. And that gives the auditors enough information to look back over this history and make sure that the history isn't changing. And if at least one auditor is behaving correctly then we, would be, then we will hopefully be able to detect tampering. Again, I can't prevent tampering. I want to be able to detect it. That's my goal. Make sense so far? All right. So, let's rewind to the original hash chain design by Kelsey and Schneier. So the idea, so these X's, these are events. This event could be <coughs> I transfer one Bitcoin to Yo. This event could be that you know, a syslog emitted the following string, doesn't matter. So these are events, and then these circles are hashes. So an arrow means that I am hashing this value. So if I have two arrows, that means I'm hashing this value and that value. Just concatenate them together and hash them. So I'm using a picture you know, that sort of cn is the hash of cn minus 1 concatenated with the message xn. These kinds of equations get unwieldy. It's helpful to be able to look at the pictures. Pictures are helpful. We like pictures. But it's useful to understand that when you see multiple arrows coming out, that means the hash of that and the hash of or this thing and that thing are concatenated together and hashed, and that's what I store here. So far, so good. And then we imagine that the logger will sign this hash and publish it. So when I log an event, I will get the previous hash, hash that together with my new thing, and that's my new hash. That's what the logger, and then I sign it. So that's my way of saying it. I'm logging this right now. And then as we add new things, then you know, the hash chain grows. So far, so good, but what if this logger became evil? The same logger that signed this message signed that message, signed that message, signed that message. So once this logger changes his mind and becomes evil, then he can rewrite history. And that's a problem I want to fix. I don't want to have to trust the logger. Instead, I have these loggers returning these commitments. So the word commitment and hash of stuff are sort of interchangeable here. 
Right? If I tell you the hash of a message, then I've committed to that message. And then later on, when you see the message, you can verify it. That's why we call so commitment is think of a commitment as a mathematical abstraction of a hash. Anyway, the logger returns a string of these commitments, and each corresponds to a log. But then the auditor, so we're introducing these auditors, and the auditors have a couple questions. They would like to be able to say, does this commitment really contain the event X that I just inserted? That would be a useful question. An auditor might also want to say, do these two commitments commit to the same history? You know, is the new commitment and the old commitment consistent? Or are we trying to fork history? Again, those of you who pay attention to Bitcoin, these are all phrases that you hear once in a while, forking the, the, the blockchain. And another relevant question, we have some old event. Is that really old event consistent with the current commitment? These are all completely reasonable questions you might want to ask of a history. And you would like these questions to be efficient to answer. So, the idea is that we want our auditors to check these commitments that they're getting from the loggers. And they want to, we want the auditors to be verifying that the new commitments are consistent with the old commitments. And that the, the new events are consistent with the new commitment. These are the sort of properties we want. In the old days, auditing meant, well, you're going to look at all of history, and boy, that's expensive, so we're not going to do that very often. So we're not going to pay attention to performance because that's super expensive. Well, I want performance to be cheap enough that we can do it all the time. That's the goal. So if it's a frequent operation, and I've got some commitment that commits to some history, then if that log, so the logger knows that this commitment, if the logger knew that that commitment wouldn't be audited, then the logger could create some other commitment, create a fork. And if auditing weren't frequent, then you'd be able to get away with it. So that would be successful tampering. That's exactly the things that Bitcoin people are freaked out about. And so therefore, it must be the case that every commitment has a non-zero probability of being audited. So auditing is necessary and it must be efficient. So when? So how frequent? How much? Well, basically every event insertion. And every set of commitments, we want to be able to audit all of that, and we want it to be super, super cheap. What do, we mean, what do I mean by cheap? I mean CPU cheap, network cheap, storage cheap. I want all of those to be cheap, so that way you have no reason not to do all of this aggressive auditing. So again, I have two kinds of auditing. I might want to verify that some message is consistent with some commitment. And you know, I and N don't have to be the same. So I might be verifying historical events, I might be verifying recent events. And I need to do these incremental audits that the brand, new, the brand newest commitment and some older commitment are consistent. So with a hash chain, anything is linear. Historical event to current event, I have to verify all the hashes between them. So that's linear in the size of the, of the chain. So historical lookups are slow. Some other people have used data structures called skip lists. So a skip list is like a linked list, but there are multiple layers, and the higher layers, the pointers jump further into the future, or further into the past rather. Um, auditing is still linear because you can't just take the big skips. You have to also verify every other damn pointer in the middle. Otherwise, there could be an inconsistency, and we don't want inconsistencies. So skip lists make it fast to find your way into the history, but they don't speed up auditing. So instead, so instead we used a binary tree. Every computer science student early in their career learns how to do binary trees. <coughs> so we're going to use binary trees, a variant on what Ralph Merkel did in 1988, so old and well established. And this means that any lookup is logarithmic because a tree is logarithmic. And we're going to do a cool way of doing um, 
storage that, that lets us do this efficiently. We don't, we're going to main, the tree is always going to be balanced. And uh, we even have some cool ways of doing deletion that I'm not really going to have time to talk about today. But I'll just mention that we, we worried about that too. We can do tamper detection probabilistically if we're trying to be super duper efficient by auditing at random. And we can dial that up or down and keep, still keep it fast. Which is, and, and that's not something that makes sense with linked lists or skip lists. But with trees, I can, if, you, if, if, if auditing every single thing is too expensive, I can let you dial in a probability anywhere you want, and I can scale. All right, so how am I going to do this binary tree? One difference between a standard binary tree and what we're calling a history tree is, is um, we want to be able to reconstruct old versions of the tree from the current tree efficiently. So here's how that's going to look. So this is a history tree that happens to have two things in it. So once again, circles are hashes, and any outbound arrow is the set of things that they're hashing. So this node hashes x1 and x2, that one hashes this one and an empty node, and finally our commitment hashes this empty node and that hash. So you just take the two hashes, concatenate them together, hash that, and that's what you store. So let's add a third node. So now I'm adding x3, I create this, this other intermediate node, and I have this hash, and, and I have an empty node. And as I grow, I start filling in, I fill in, I fill in, and so far so good. Once we get, once we're completely full, then we actually build another whole layer. So then the, the root goes one up, and all of our leaves will continue to be at exactly the same depth. So the, the, but the, the historical nodes stay put. Like, if I want to, see, if I want to see what history looked like at time three, I know deterministically that I can ignore x four and I can ignore this entire subtree. So I can, just by pretending that things are the empty tree, I can easily move forward and backward in time. And I can derive what the old tree should have been from what the current tree is. This is fun. So how can I take advantage of that? So let's do an audit. So let's say our auditor looked at the tree at time three, saw three events, saw these four hashes, and remembered everything. Well, then, so now C3, the auditor has kept a note that says, at time three, I saw this commitment, and everything was good. Then time marches on, time four, time five, time six, time seven. And now the auditor says, hey, storage system, give me the current commitment. And it says, right, here's C7. So now I want to prove that C7 and C3 are talking about the same events. Well, like I said, it's super easy. I want to prove that those are consistent. And all I, it turns out all I need is a constant amount of data. I don't need, and from these nodes, I can reconstruct, I can take my old, I can reconstruct C3, or rather, given the old C3 and given this, I can, I, all the blue stuff I can recompute. I don't need to store it, I can recompute it. So then, I can derive C7. I can compare. So what about the old C3? Well, let's see. How does this work? So there are three, there's actually three things I want to prove. First, I want to prove that this, the, the, this so okay, the auditor isn't doing a proof. The logger is producing a proof. The logger sees everything. And the logger is producing an efficient proof. How is that going to work? Well, they want to send a proof that, that proves the following three properties. That the proof is consistent with C7, the last commitment, 
that the proof is consistent with C3, the original commitment, and therefore that these two, that these two commitments are also consistent. So proving C7 is easy if you send along these green nodes, then the, the, um, the, aud the, the auditor can, can hash their way up the tree and generate something equal to C7. So far, so good. And the auditor didn't need to see these. The auditor didn't need to see those. So there's some efficiency gains here. But how do I prove that, how do I generate a proof that's also consistent with C3? Well, the, I can ignore all of that stuff. And instead, well, you gave me x3 and you gave me this hash. That's enough for me to recompute the root at, times, at time three. And if, 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 I, if given that set of green nodes, I can compute C3 and I can compute C7, then I'm pretty confident that the tree is, con is consistent and the, and the proofs are consistent. So the fact that the auditor never saw x1, x2, x4, and x, or x5 and 6, but still was able to derive this proof is a little bit counterintuitive. So I've proved that the commitments are consistent, but I didn't look at all the events. I skipped over big chunks of the events. That might make you feel a little bit nervous. The trick, though, is that I saw a hash of the event. And so even though I never looked at the event, I still saw something that's related to it. So in the future, if I do an audit of that event, I still have a commitment to it. So I'm making a trade-off here. By not looking at everything, I can go much, much faster. And then, when will I actually audit it? I can do that later. I can do it probabilistically. But still, I'll be able to detect tampering. I'm just detecting tampering later. And in return for delaying that computation, I get a huge efficiency. So how do I do a membership proof? Like, let's say I have this commitment C7, and I'm trying to prove that X3 is consistent with C7. So once again, all I need to do the proof are the green nodes. And once I have the green nodes, I can take X3 and I can recompute all the blue stuff. And, I, and that's enough for me to prove that, that, that X3 is consistent with C7 without me ever needing to look at X1, X2, X5, X6. This is the essential idea of a Merkle hash tree. But I only need a logarithmic amount of data in order to construct a proof. All right, so we built it, we ran it, and you know, we even like built it as a syslog implementation, like you know, you, standard Berkeley Unix syslog. So first, the big O performance. So our history tree is logarithmic for everything. Logarithmic for proving two commits are consistent. Logarithmic for membership proofs that some uh, thing in the history is consistent with a given commitment inserts a logarithmic, everything is log n. So that's fantastic. Whereas, okay. Um, <laughs> you like that. Yeah. In particular, it's really nice. I mean, now you might say, well, wait a minute. You know, I can insert to a normal hash chain and that's like constant time. So aren't you making me pay a lot on insert? Eh, if, you, if that turns out to be a really big issue, then you could imagine, just like people do with standard sysloggers, that every once in a while you turn the log over. You, you archive the old log, you start a new log. That's standard practice in Android logging, it's standard practice in Unix logging. That if you, re, you can basically decide when, when log n is too big and then you retire your log and move on to the next log. So you can, again, tune how much you're willing to pay here. Whereas with these skip lists or with hash chains, you know, depending on exactly how you do it, it's either logarithmic. You know, it might be logarithmic for you to do a membership check, but if you're paranoid about all the links, you're going to pay the linear cost of looking at everything. And 
verifying the commitments are the same is linear. So there's, that's a nice benefit. All right. Well, so for our syslog thing, we grabbed our CS departmental web server. We grabbed four million events from eleven hosts over four days, and we like repeated it twenty times to get an eighty million event trace. We figured this is getting big enough to start to be interesting. Our code is a weird mix of C++ and Python. First, we built everything in Python and got it working. Then we took the critical paths and built those in C and plugged them into Python. So if you ever want to steal our code, well, you can have the Python stuff that's easy and clean or the C plugin stuff that makes it go faster. Your call. Anyway, single threaded on an old dual core machine with a cool memory mapped data structure that I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, except to say that each new log entry goes in line in memory. So we can write this out if to disk very, very efficiently using old DSA signatures and old you should never use it SHA-1 because well, time has marched on since then. But you could replace these DSA signatures with ECDSA and you could replace our SHA-1 with SHA-256. That's up to you. But, and again, old slow machine and a lot of memory for the day, not so much anymore. Doing that, we were able to get you know, not quite 2,000 insert events per second. And the overwhelming majority of this was that whenever we did an insert, we were doing a digital signature. Modern machines can do digital signatures a lot, lot faster than old machines. So this is probably going to scream on a new machine. Um, auditing, so we were you know, just we said, what if we're only looking at relatively recent events? And we were able to compute 10 to 18,000 proofs per second, again, around 8,000 membership proofs per second. So the log server on the slow, crappy processor from 2007 was able to move along significantly fast, much faster than the insert performance even. How, it would be fun to rerun this on a modern computer and see how the numbers have changed. My rough guess is take everything and put another zero at the end. Another interesting bit of future work would be trying to do the same thing on some kind of cluster and trying to get some kind of horizontal scaling. That would be a really excellent bit of future work that we haven't done. That would be fun for somebody else to try. Although if you get rid of locality, so now you're willing to look anywhere in the log, and so now you're like touching disk, suddenly performance sucks because disk sucks. But hey, guess what? Since 2007, disk is going away. Now you can get these huge SSDs so random access is cheap again. So maybe it doesn't have to suck. On a modern machine, we might still go really fast if you use SSDs. And the proofs themselves are, rel are you know, four kilobytes or less. Chump change, very small. So, Needless to say, there's a lot of detail that I'm totally skimming over, like exactly how do we do the writes in order so that way we can get very efficient memory and disk behavior. I'm not talking about that now. I'm similarly not talking, we, we, we came up with this cool idea we called Merkle aggregation. So we could, we, we could take attributes of the data and sort of accumulate those attributes up to the root and you know, anything that's sort of mathematically equivalent to addition, we could do. So like, how many interesting things are there here? How many interesting things are there here? And we can do that addition all the way up the tree and have it be part of the hashes. We even came up with this cool idea of what we called safe deletion, where I want to be able to delete old events, but how do I, because maybe I have a log deletion policy, Maybe we have a corporate policy that says data that's older than something is not desirable. And it's, you know, our corporate policy is we throw away any data more than X months old. What does that do for the hashes? You know, that deleting data seems to violate all of this hash stuff. So we came up with a way of working around that too. In essence, you leave a note that says that everything from this part of the tree on down is gone and here's what the hash used to be, and then you migrate that up to a new root. 
It's a little bit of a hack. But it suffice to say that you can still prove consistency proofs from before the deletion and after the deletion. But obviously, you can't prove membership of something that's gone. Nonetheless, it's still really useful. All right. If you want to see mathematical proofs, it's in the paper. If you want to see code, it's online on our website. All right. I'm about to change gears and switch to these, these uh, persistent authenticated dictionaries. So now would be a good time for you to ask me questions about history logs. Yes? So, um, in what way is a history log then different from Merkle's original uh, paper? Um, you might think of this as optimizing the living daylights out of Merkle's original paper. I mean, the gist of Merkle's paper is you have a set of events, you compute a Merkle tree on it once, and you're done. The notion that you want to do inserts and edits and, you know, Incremental behavior is not part of his original paper. So that's really where we're doing value add on Merkel. Anybody here ever use BitTorrent? Come on, <laughs> you've all used BitTorrent. I mean, a, bit, a dot torrent file more or less is a Merkel hash tree over uh, BitTorrent blocks, chunks? I forget what they call them. And then as you, down, as you get these blocks from the BitTorrent people who you don't trust, you verify the, the correctness of the blocks using the hash information in your .torrent file. And how do I get a .torrent file? Why, with a magnet link. What's a magnet link? It's a hash of a torrent file. And so then if, if somebody tried to feed me an incorrect torrent file, the magnet link wouldn't verify. So BitTorrent uses this stuff all over the place. Bitcoin uses stuff like this and uh, uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> anyway, Bitcoin had some interesting crypto, but they didn't bother to take an economics class. It's a real problem. Don't use Bitcoin. It will die. All right. <laughs> I disagree. Okay. <laughs> it will slowly collapse in a heap. Uh, and then it will be a zombie that refuses to die. The value, yeah, of those data structures will live forever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so my, my 10 cent opinion is Bitcoin is toast, but this notion of secure logs is, is really fantastic. And I imagine that there will be lots of companies that get into the business of maintaining your log for you. And that could be a Goldman Sachs or other big bank, that could be an Amazon, that could be a Google. And you might say, hey, what about privacy? Well, there's nothing that says you can't encrypt log entries before you throw them at the server. Then you start getting, well, what if I want to query and it's encrypted, and now you're getting into search over encrypted data, and that's not my problem. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm focused on integrity today. All right, other questions about this stuff? Shall we march onward? Okay. So, so is it a single auditor that's working on? on you could have as many auditors as you want. Okay. And the trick is that the auditors are making queries, the logger is producing proofs. And of course the logger could easily be sharded and run across some giant cluster. Mm -hmm. At least for assuming that they can, have, they can replicate the data and it's read only, so why not? So if you need to horizontally scale out the logger's proof mm -hmm. generation, because the data is read-only, then I could have as many Amazon nodes as I want producing proofs. And, I could have, and the idea is that then I can run that in the cloud, and I can buy as much time on Amazon as I want. And then I have the couple of machines that I trust, run by people I trust, not in Amazon, but in my own trusted environment. And they just ping Amazon to make sure Amazon hasn't lost anything. And you say it's read-only because you would notice if somebody wrote because of the tamper evidence right. or, or because you So a curious thing about cryptographic hash-based data structures is they are exactly functional programming. So how many of you have taken a functional programming class at some point in your life? Great. So in a functional universe, whether it's Scheme or Haskell or ML or whatever, once you get a value, you're, you don't change it. It's exactly what we're doing, except instead of just having a pointer to an object, we have a pointer with teeth. 
you know, it's a pointer that can verify the object once you read it. So this is exactly functional programming with hashes. And so functional programming data structures fundamentally are read only. And we, if you really, really care, read our paper, we talk about how you might do deletion. Because, because just like when you do deletion from a functional data structure, you don't delete it. You make a new data structure that shares a bunch of stuff with the old data structure, except for the updates. Well, you kind of do the same thing here. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, so uh, you noticed that uh, there was tampering. Um, I guess what benefit does that give you in order of uh, actually getting the logs that were tampered with? Okay, what happens when you notice tampering? Yeah, better way to say that. Oh, the first thing is you call the police, or you call your lawyer, or whatever. I mean, at this point, you now have strong evidence that the people you were paying to maintain your log failed to do their job. You have a cryptographically strong proof that they failed. Now what? Um, do you sue them? <laughs> do you beat them up? I don't know. Okay, because I get it. The whole architecture here is, I can't afford to store all my crap, so I'm paying Amazon to do it. And then it turns out that Amazon didn't do the thing I was paying them to do. Now I'm unhappy with them. And I can express that unhappiness in a lawsuit or any of a variety of other ways. But I have a cryptographically strong proof to back up my unhappiness. Yay? Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, just going back to the fact that nobody's ever been uh, sued for... Um, cryptographic misuse <laughs> that well, I know, the, but, it, but I get your point. Yeah, it's not that, that you'd be suing them because they computed a bad hash. You'd be suing them because they failed to store your data. And you know, we have these things called service level agreements, you know, where the vendor promises to have a certain level of uptime and answer things. You know, this is what lawyers do. They write contracts. And you know, your contract would be, when I ask you to do this, you'll produce this proof and blah, blah, blah. Tamper evident, not tamper resistant. If you want resistant, then you should hire multiple companies, Amazon and Rackspace and somebody else. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Just throw more money at the problem. All right, let's move on. So our next topic is persistent authenticated dictionaries. So first, what is, or just pads? What's a pad? What's a dictionary? Well, first, we want to have, I mean, this is a key value store. These were first invented in the context of certificate revocation lists. And, but they're really general purpose. Any key value store will do. Anybody who's ever played in the world of peer-to-peer -peer has run into these DHTs, uh, distributed hash tables. They're just key value stores. If you ever programmed Android and you want to save preferences, key value stores. If you ever program JSON and use JSON objects, key value stores, they're everywhere. So our security model is slightly different from the history trees. We have a trusted <coughs> author who's publishing this dictionary, but they're storing it on an untrusted server, again, our Amazon or equivalent. And we have clients who are querying the dictionary. Another example of this that you might have heard of is called DNS. <laughs> you know, but of course, DNS doesn't just have one publisher. It has a large number of publishers, and that's what makes DNS sex so confusing. So we're simplifying. There's only one publisher, but there's multiple readers. And our author, our publisher, has a digital signature primitive, and we want to allow the client to verify these signatures. Now, when we say the, the P in a pad, persistent means I want to be able to make a query at a particular time in history. So it's not enough for me to ask about the current state of the dictionary. I want to be able to ask about the historical state of the dictionary at any time. That might be interesting. And it makes the data structure design a lot more fun. So let's go with that. All right, onward. So we have an author which has this pad generator module inside, and it has 
two APIs. I can insert a key value tuple or I can remove a key. That's the author's API. Insert a key value tuple or remove a key altogether. That's it. And then somehow this pad generator is going, oh yeah, wait, I added another operation. I need to be able to snapshot. So the idea is that I say add, 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 remove, add, add, remove, snapshot. So a snapshot, that's like a publishing operator. And then all of the changes I made since the prior snapshot are ready to go. And you might imagine there are efficiencies to be gained by not snapshotting on every single edit. You know, maybe I want to do a whole bunch of edits and then publish a snapshot all at once. Therein lies efficiency. And now I'm going to produce this data structure that I can now store on anything. And, there's n and this machine is this is your Amazon. It's evil, and we we want that machine to not be involved in trust. They're just a storage mechanism. So now we have clients, and the clients want to be able to make lookups, and so. They say, for a given version or time, give me the value of a, of a key. And I want to get back two things. I want the answer, you know, give me the value associated with that key, and give me a proof that this is the correct value for this key at that time. So I don't just need an answer, I need a proof that the answer is correct. And so the server, we don't trust the server to maintain the... We don't, we don't trust... The server is evil, but the server can still do compute for us. And the server can compute proofs, just like last time. So you know, we're assuming a single author, and for now I'm going to assume there's a snapshot after every update, but I'm going to start introducing some efficiency gains later when, when, that, when we take that away. But one step at a time. The sort of things that we're worried about we want to worry about how much time does it take to do an update, what's the size of an update, what's the storage of an update, what's the size of a proof. We want to make all that stuff small. And when, so, you know, we're, so we're worried about the time it takes on the author to do the computation. We're worried about the size of the signed blob of stuff that we're shipping over to the server. We're worried about the storage on the server, and we're worried about the size and perhaps, perhaps not the computation of, of generating these proofs. So there's a lot of stuff that we're worried about. And you know, we could imagine doing this for certificate revocation lists, we could do this for backups, we could do this for our version repository, we could do this for stock tickers, we could do this for software updates various smart card applications where we want to look up historical data. All right. We are not the first ones to look at designing these things, but we made them faster and more efficient. So, first I'll tell you about tree-based structures where everything is logarithmic, then I'll tell you about a thing that we came up with where everything is constant, which is kind of crazy and cool. But first things first, let's do trees. So I have some, so again, arrows are like hashes. So I have some kind of a root, and I have various keys in my dictionary in a tree, and just like Merkle did way back when, a proof is like a logarithmic trace through this. And what about when I want to update my tree? Basic, boring, functional programming 101 says that when I want to insert some new thing, then I replicate the nodes and hang on to the new root. So when I've got R4 is the version of that thing at time 4, I want to insert some new key, I'm going to replicate... You know, so this ZZZ would have been to the right of world, but I can't edit the old node because functional programming, but I can create a new logarithmic trace up to the root. So, functional tree insert. I make every sophomore at my university implement this, and they hate me. Yay. Anyway, <laughs> and so you hang on to all the roots, and the storage, you add log n storage per update. So, wait, if I store n things, what's the size of my total store? n log n. 
what happens if log n is big enough to matter? Every once in a while you can you know, create an epoch, store the old one, and start over. So not a big deal. Now, there was an awesome paper by Sarnak and Tarjan. Uh, Bob Tarjan is like a Turing Award winner. And they came up with a... So Tarjan is famous for what are what's called amortized algorithms, which are algorithms where every once in a while an operation is expensive, but over time it's still cheap. Um, probably the amortized algorithm that you all know the best is garbage collection. Most of the time, allocating memory is super, super cheap, but occasionally it's very expensive when the, when the garbage collector has to run, but modern garbage collectors are cheap in total, but they're occasionally expensive. Same deal here. So version nodes have amortized constant cost per update, rather than the log n cost per update. So we figured out how to make a functional hash-based version of Sarnax and Tarjan's versioned data structure that, that, that gets us down from this log n path copying to amortized constant cost. Yeah. So, ready for some ugly data structure design? Here we go. So here's a basic tree. At time zero, we have nothing. Done. Yay. Oh, let's make it more complicated. At time one, we insert R. And R has a left and a right, and we're just gonna, we're gonna hang those out over here. So R has no children. But then I insert S. So R has two sets of children, the old children and the new children. So when I insert a node that has old children but no new children, I, I leave the old ones alone and I update the new ones. So instead of good old-fashioned trees where you have left and right, now I have old left, old right, and new left, new right. And inside the node I have a time, t. So I know that at time two or later, I should use the new children, and at time one or earlier, I should use the old children. And then what happens when I want to insert something that would require more children? You know, what happens if I want to make the second edit? Well, now I just have to make a new copy of R. So if I said delete S, well, I've already used the new children, so now I'm going to make new ones. So it sort of de devolves into path copying. But, so okay, now let's do another insert. I'm going to insert T. So T is greater than R, it goes to the right. So on the new children side, we have T to the right. Sort of get a feel for this data structure now. And I'm going to insert some V, which is to the right of T. And I'm going to do it, let's say I then add E. Now I'm going to, that, that has to go to the left of R. But R, R, R already has two sets of children, so I need a new R, but I don't need a new T. So this is a more complicated version. This is more complicated than path copying. It's amortized constant cost rather than log n cost. I don't make my sophomores do this. Then they would come after me with sharp objects. But I made my grad student do it. And the fun part of this is that so I just made seven snapshots, and if you count the number of nodes here on the board, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I did seven inserts and I have seven nodes. This is really cool. So I got rid of that log n business. Now I'm down to constant cost per insert, no matter what. That's fun. So if I want to look at this tree at time five, I start from my root number five, and it tells me to go over here to this R. And then if I ask for a query at time five, I know I have to go to the right. And if I get here at time equals five, I know I have to go to the right. So every node has a timestamp, and it tells you whether to go left or right at that given time. So our nodes just got fat. So there's a, a constant overhead, but it's still constant per insert, which is awesome. All right. But how do I put how do I shove hashes into here? 
When I had good old-fashioned path copying functional trees, hashes were easy. because Whenever I allocate a node, I take the children, I hash them, I store it. Here I can't do that anymore. Because now I sort of have the old hash and the new hash. Ew. So what are we going to do? What we decided is eh, we, we, we'll pretend that there's a hash. And we can recompute the hash at any given time. You know, as, long, we can, as long as we can go down to the leaves, we can always recompute any hash and pretend that we can hash the tree at any time. Just now the intermediate values, you know, the, the, the hash of a node at a time is different every time. But that's okay. Because as long as I have all the roots, or sorry, as long as I have all the leaves, I can, re I can reconstruct the hash tree at each time. So that's not bad. And then at that point it just becomes a caching problem. Should I recompute every hash on every query, or should I hang on to old ones? So I can build an auxiliary data structure that's a cache. I can recompute any hash, or I can look it up in my cache. Hash, cache. But not Bitcoin hash, cache. Anyway, it's a cache of hashes. It's not a hash of cache. <laughs> I hope, I, I hope this plays well for the not native English speakers in the audience. It's confusing enough for the English speakers. Yeah, so we're caching hashes, we're not hashing cache. Okay. And so then it, it's just a matter of performance. I can spend as much memory as I want maintaining this cache, and it doesn't affect correctness, it only affects performance. So how much so we built three different caching strategies. I can cache nowhere, I can cache everywhere, or I can just keep one layer of hash in the middle of the tree. And you end up with these really crazy order of square root of n log v, uh, where like n is the number of nodes and v is, I forget what v is. It's like, Suffice to say that you can dial up your performance versus storage trade-off any way you want. And that's really all we need to talk about for now. If you say no caches, then that means that storage is constant, which is great, but generating a lookup proof is order n because I have to dig all the way down. Whereas if I keep my caches everywhere, now I have to do a whole bunch of x, I have to do logarithmic work to update my, ca my, my cache. But now my proof generation is log n log v. Yeah, n is the n is the total amount of events that I'm storing, and v is the number of versions. So if if, if time goes in big jumps, then I get some benefit here. So anyway, suffice to say that I have choices, and if I'm deploying a server like this, I can I can tune it. All right. But maybe I can do better than this. Maybe I can really rock the house. What would that look like? So I'll tell you about a design we came up with that we called tuple pads. Functional programming people love tuples. That's when I just return a pair of things, or, re or return three things. I just return a small list of things, and we call that a tuple. So our design has constant lookup proof size, constant storage size. It's all constant. So it's awesome, right? Well, we have a bunch of hard problems we have to solve. So imagine our dictionary is, again, a set of key values. And we're going to divide, rather than treating a key as just an opaque value, that, you know, and all we have is equality, now we're going to imagine that our key space is like a sorted thing. And you know, it's like our keys are now numbers. They're integers. Of course, integers can store strings, but the important part is that keys have structure, and I can ask, is key A greater than key B, is key A less than key B, and every key has a position in a timeline. So, not, you know, for arbitrary strings, this is not too onerous. And so we can do that is we can divide the key space into intervals. 
And so I can now create a statement that says key K1 has value C1 and there is no key in the dictionary between K1 and K2. Because don't forget, I also want to be able to do lookups on keys that aren't there, and I want to be able to get a proof that a key is absent. In the tree universe, I would get a logarithmic trace down to the root that would give me a key less than and a key greater than. And that logarithmic trace would prove to me the absence of the key. Here, if I can get a statement of this form, that here's an interval that starts at key 1 and goes up to key 2 exclusive, this thing all by itself, if it were digitally signed, would not only prove to me that the value of K1 is C1, it would prove to me the absence of any keys between K1 and K2, all with a single signed statement. That's fun. So let's put a bunch of them in. So now I can have a series of these signed statements. Each statement tells you that I validate that, the, that K3's key is C, you know, the, va the value for K3 is C3, and there is no other value until you get to K4, or no other key, etc. So, oops. Of course, I need to also have a, a minimum. So I need to have a, so if I'm doing a query for something that's less than K1, I need to have some statement about the world before my first key. Again, not a big deal. So, so far I just told you about an authenticated dictionary. Now I want to make it a persistent authenticated dictionary. So it's going to get a little bit more complicated. So now I can make a statement that says, in version 1 snapshot, key K1 has value C1, and there's no key in the dictionary between K1 and K2. And I can have a series of statements like this that I sign. So here's sort of a picture of it. At each version, I have a set of statements about the state of the dictionary. Every box here is a digitally signed statement. And so when somebody makes a query, I just hand them the box for that key at that version. Constant sized proofs. Except now I have, as time moves on, I'm generating a lot of these boxes. And I have to store every single box on the server. Right? If somebody wants to make a query for this key, I hand them that box. If somebody wants to make a query for, for you know, some value in here, then I return that box or the one after, whatever. So the observation you would make is that you might notice that there's a lot of things that are constant between versions. Each of these, um, each of these there's nothing here statements is the same on version 2 through version 7. Each of these is the same from version 4 to version 6. So wouldn't it be nice if we could make statements that looked more like this? So here's a statement that's, that talks about from this version to this version, between this key and that key, here's a value. So now we can have these statements that talk about ranges of time, not just ranges of the key space. So we call that superseding. And then when you want to publish something new, you, you know, when you move from version 6 to version 7, you update the ones, you, know, you, you publish new versions to replace the old ones. So you're saving server storage, but you're still doing a bunch of work on the publisher. But when you do an insert, you have at most two up, you know, you, you, you have two things that update, but you have to recompute. Uh, yeah, you, you have to you have to you have you have to you have to update them, but the server storage has it you know, changes by the server storage doesn't grow outrageously. Yeah. Okay. So I'm so my storage on the server is now optimum in the sense that I'm storing one box for you know, for exactly how much complexity there is in the changes of my dictionary. So I'm optimum in server storage, but I'm not necessarily optimum in the amount of messages that I'm sending to the server. So we might want to optimize that too. But at least I have the same update time as before and the same update size as before as well for what I send from the, from the publisher to the server. 
So here's how we're going to get some more efficiency. We call this speculation. And the idea is that I can have multiple versions of this data structure. And I can have a version, I can have a, a data structure that's that's um, says, I think, I guess, I hope that this key will be constant for the next 10 versions. And then I can have another data structure that says, oh no, that was wrong, that was wrong. So I can have one data structure that makes big speculative jumps into the future for versions that don't exist yet. And I can have another data structure that corrects it, which is kind of weird, but it works. And when I do this, I end up having many, many fewer updates. You should think about this as analogous to garbage collection where I have a young generation and a tenured generation. The idea is, except you know, normally in, in garbage collection you promote something to the tenured generation. Here what happens is you pretend that something isn't going to change and I can publish something that says that it will be constant for a long time in the future. And then I just have a, a secondary proof that says, oh wait a minute, I was wrong. And so now I have to send two things. And anyway, how does that work? So I have this old generation where I make a claim into the future, and then I have a young generation where I correct that claim. So now I get this weird statement that says, in generation zero, snapshot v1 through this has some value. And then I have a secondary proof from the young generation that proves there's no contradiction. And so then I'd be updating the young generation with, with each of these corrections, and then I would update the old generation again. Seems kind of clunky, but it gives you some giant big O improvements. I'm going to push on because I'm running out of time. Suffice to say that we can, you, your, all the messages now, G is the number of generations, so everything has this G constant in it. The more generations I have, everything grows by a constant factor, but I have this n to the one over g thing. So now that the amount of message traffic I have starts dropping rapidly. This is really cool. We even played with a thing called RSA accumulators, and suffice to say that they are so damn slow that it didn't matter. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. So every one of these boxes is an implementation that we made. My grad student got busy. And each of these implementations, you know, different kinds of caching in the tree, different strategies for maintaining the tuples, and you can see that you can sort of dial up your performance trade-off. If you want to have a persistent authenticated dictionary, you can make a decision based on your expected query rate and insert rate for what's going to be most efficient for you. Kind of cool, right? You know, so if you decide that, you know, I really want, don't, I want log in for everything, then here you go, tree-based with path copying. If you decide that um, I want to make my updates really, really cheap, then there you go. Okay, what about the real world? Well, um, you know, you want to run a real computer, and real computers you measure things. So let's measure things. So 21 algorithms, and we also threw in some algorithms that other people built that used um, path copying skip lists and path copying red black trees. Um, so 12 tree pads six tuple pads, and three things using these uh, RSA accumulators. And I haven't even told you what lightweight signatures are. It's sort of a hash chaining structure where you reveal later versions of the hash. Anyway, don't worry about it. So we built all of this stuff. And again, it was this weird hybrid of Python and C++ where we were using a native library for all the big number arithmetic and open SSL code to do all the signatures. And again, this is our 2007 slow machine. We used two different kinds of benchmarks, one where we inserted 10,000 keys with a snapshot every time, one where we, we took a trace from a buddy of mine who, he had a server that watched the price of luxury goods 
fluctuating over time on different websites. His, he had a client which was a big name Swiss manufacturer of luxury goods that he doesn't want me to name, and he kept track of how people pirated and sold their goods online. So I got his dump of pricing. Anyway, so that was like 27 snapshots with 14,000 keys and 39,000 updates. Okay, two different traces of key value stores evolving over time, and we <coughs> compared all of these things. Well, it turns out Red black trees are pretty damn good, and skip lists suck. So, you know, red black trees, anybody ever tried to implement a red black tree? Pain in the ass, right? All these weird rules. Well, it turns out they work. <laughs> so, yay! Whereas skip lists turn out to really, even though they're sort of a beautiful, cute data structure, no, don't use them. Um, when we, we, we looked at all these different kinds of, of repository sizes, and here's what happens. So, when you have 100,000 keys, you have this curious thing. I can use half the memory by having, by having you know, this, this, this thing where I only cache some of the hashes. If I cache all of the hashes, my memory almost doubles. Yet, Look at the lookup rate. When I cache everywhere, then, I can, then my lookup rate becomes explosively fast. Whereas when I do this median cache, I have to do more work. I have to recompute the hashes I was missing. So you get to decide, what do I care about? Do I care more about memory usage, or do I care more about lookup rate? You decide, and then I'll give you the better algorithm. So are you, do, you have an, do, you have, do, you, do you have updates more frequent than queries, or do you have queries more frequent than updates? If you have a really high query rate, then you want to be down here. If you have a really high update rate, maybe you'd rather be here. Or if you have a, have a huge dictionary where that 2x matters, maybe you'd rather be there. So let's have some more costs. So let's, do, let's, let's use a different unit for cost. Dollars, or if you prefer euros, or if you really prefer bitcoins. Anyway, so you know, should we be pricing out big expensive computers? Should we be pricing out switches? No. How about money? So we used Amazon's EC2 pricing as of 2007. And at the time, the price for 200 kilobits of networking and the price for one second of CPU were the same. Today's numbers, I'm sure, are different, but it's interesting because now I can take storage cost, network cost, and compute cost, and turn them all into one unit, dollars. Because at the end of the day, the thing you care about if you're running this on Amazon is you care about dollars. So that's fun. Let's do algorithms in terms of dollars. Anyway, so. We can either look at the absolute costs of each operation, or we can just look at ratios. So here's a fun thing. Here, here's my cash median and cash everywhere strategy. Remember, this one was hugely faster, but it's only twice the price. So even though I'm doing a lot more CPU, I'm saving memory, and in return, I'm paying about 2x the cost per query. Here, I've got like twice the memory, and even though I was radically faster, I'm only paying about half the price. So it's really interesting that even though the, the performance numbers are radically different, the cost numbers, not so much. So dollars are a really interesting unit for algorithm design. I highly recommend that. Anyway, so tuple pads turn out to be really, really cheap for doing lookups because you do a query and I return you one of these little cells. But they're really expensive for updates because there's a whole bunch of work to generate the new rows and, and multiple generations, etc. Tree pads are sort of cheap on lookups and cheap on updates. So the question is, where do you want to be? So here's a fun graph. The x-axis is the ratio of how many lookups per update. 
The y-axis is the cost per lookup. Okay, so if we're over here, we have a very we have lots of updates and not very many lookups. If we're over here, this is a database that's being published infrequently and queried all the time. So you tell me where you are on this graph, and then whichever one of these lines is lowest is the winner. So um, over here, this is the red-black path copying thing. As long as the lookup rate is low, red-black trees are super efficient and this is the cheapest. But once you, the lookup rate gets bigger, now this like speculative uh, tuple thing starts winning. And you increase a little bit more, and now the superseding thing I talked about briefly wins. And once you've got this ridiculous rate, then it sort of doesn't matter. I, don't need, I want to get rid of all the speculation and stuff, and I just want to have these very simple dictionaries. Because the queries are so expensive that I want to have cheap, concise responses. And I, I briefly mentioned these RSA accumulators. That's this purple line. It never wins. The cost of doing RSA never ever wins. So this was a, you could like do these RSA exponentiations and they multiply together and they can they can tell you set membership or absence. It's so expensive that it's not worth it ever. That was kind of neat. So anyway, you can see that there's there's sort of three inflection points, and so. If you were going to be using one of these persistent authenticated dictionary structures, you would need to look at the current price of Amazon and your current profile of your query to insert ratio. And then you look at the current inflection points and you decide which algorithm is best for you. Kind of cool, huh? So you got to look at bandwidth cost, you got to look at CPU cost, and you got to look at constant factors. They all matter. So anyway, wrapping up, I've shown you a whole bunch of radically different ways of implementing the same interface. You know, key value update, remove key, snapshot, and making queries. And we did this really <coughs> nifty thing of trying to compare them all in a single unit, dollars, because ultimately this is really meant to be run in the cloud and all you really care about is what your pay, is your bill to Amazon. So anyway, we sort of helped you figure that out. Right, wrapping it all up, we talked about pads, we talked about tamper evident histories, we talked about real world costs, and you can get all of our code online. You can see all of the papers with more details, and more proofs, more algorithms, more goodies, and I've got I've got eight minutes for questions. Any questions? Yes. Um, did you ever look at any um, uh, cache oblivious data structures? Cache oblivious data structures. So these are data structures that are meant to have constant time performance, no matter what. Uh, yes, no or, matter what, uh, no matter where in the memory hierarchy you are. Um, right. So that's something you would do if you were trying to avoid timing attacks. You know, if you're if you're encrypting a value and you're really, really concerned that somebody with a stopwatch is trying to figure out the secret that you're encrypting, then it's super important that you have really constant time. Uh, well, it's also for very, very large data structures, right? Um, so that's, yeah. Anyway, I was just wondering. Yeah. So we didn't look at that. Yeah. It's, and you know, maybe it would win, maybe it wouldn't. Just wondering. Yeah. I don't know. I mean. The fact that we're like digging back for a paper from 1986 and borrowing data structures that are that old suggests you know, maybe we should be digging through more recent data structure conferences and maybe we can come up with yet another algorithm that has yet another different performance envelope. Um, yeah, somebody uh, that works with me has been doing a lot of research into that and found it interesting. Yeah, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me if you could improve on this. But I doubt you could improve on every single one under every single circumstance. <laughs> you'd probably add yet another curve with yet more inflection points, and you'd probably, you could optimize for a specific area. I mean, we weren't trying to optimize for anything. We just built a bunch of different things and ran them with no idea how they were going to cost out until we ran them. 
And you know, when, when bandwidth and compute and storage are all put in the same unit, it just becomes a fun way to look at algorithms. Totally. Um, they're Cache oblivious data structures have a tie in to cache oblivious algorithms, so they're very complementary. It's interesting. Yeah, that would be a fun thing to look into. If you wanted to be a grad student of mine, <laughs> we, could, we could totally go there. <laughs> I would love to. Come to Texas, be a grad student. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So when you have more than one trusted author, welcome to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, everybody who wants to spend money is sort of kind of a trusted author. And they make signed statements that say, I give a Bitcoin to you. And then that message goes somewhere. And eventually these miners, who are sort of like publishers, pick up on all of them and then put them in these blocks, and then they hash the blocks, etc. So if you have multiple authors, then you need to have a way of getting the data from the author into the data structure construction. Bitcoin has a kludgy solution to that problem. If you were willing to have more trust in the system, you could imagine that rather than me having to convince a bunch of miners in China that they care about my transaction, and maybe they do and maybe they don't. Maybe instead, uh, I'm paying my bank and my bank is maintaining this. And so I'm publishing to my bank and then my bank is publishing to the world. And so then I have a contractual relationship. I will give you a certain number of, of events to publish and you will charge me X dollars per event. That would, be, that would be a totally easier to implement thing and you don't need the mess of Bitcoin. There, and there's nothing wrong with that. There was actually a company called Surety, S-U-R-E-T-Y, now out of business. And what they did was they allowed you to prove that a document existed at a point in time. And they would, people would email or send them hashes all day long. And at the end of the day, they'd build a Merkle hash tree and publish the root hash as a classified advertisement in the New York Times. And then if you wanted to prove that your document existed on a given day, you could get the appropriate copy of the New York Times, back when that was a thing you might find on paper somewhere, flip to the classifieds, find the little ad that has a number, and then you could go to them and ask them to produce the, a trace through the Merkle tree. The only problem with this is that they went out of business. So I don't know if there's anybody left today who can produce a surety proof from something that you paid them for years ago. The stuff that I'm describing, the, all of these data, you know, the server is not trusted. So there's nothing that says that, let's say you start with, I don't know, JP Morgan, and you pay them a bunch of money and they do all this, and then JP Morgan says, we're bored of this business, we're not interested. They could sell copies of their data structure to anybody who wants to buy it. And then anybody could produce the proofs. I'm not trusting JP Morgan to do anything more than have a computer with a data structure that will do some compute over it. I'm not trusting them to do the compute correctly, because I'll, I'll verify it if they, if they cheat. So in theory, you could design a, a modern version of Surety where you could have multiple vendors and I could pay each one, and I could publish to each one, and if any one of them goes away, I've got the other ones. You could even imagine a crazy world where they replicate each other and compete for who will give you the cheapest proofs. That would be fun. Does that answer your question? I mean, there's nothing wrong with trusting companies. We trust companies all the time. I trusted United Airlines to get me here from America. It even worked. <laughs> you know, you, I gave them money, and they gave me a flimsy piece of paper. But it got me on the airplane. It's amazing. Trust, it's useful. More questions? Um, 
Are yeah. you still involved in, or are you, you, uh, do you keep up to date with cryptocurrencies even though you hate Bitcoin? Uh, do I keep up with cryptocurrencies even though I hate Bitcoin? It's not really my research area, so I don't focus on it. Whenever I look at Bitcoin, I get a little bit sick. You know, the fact... Did you lose a lot of money? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I, I, I have not. I'm staying far, far away from Bitcoin. I mean, uh, the, the thing that I like about Bitcoin is I like hash chains and I like crypto data structures. Mm. The thing that I dislike about Bitcoin is that we're converting coal into pollution with a side effect of maintaining a currency. That seems dumb. It's just, it, it sort of insults my intelligence that we have to like use that much electricity to maintain the integrity of a currency. We should be able to do a lot better than that. I was just going to say there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting work in uh, factum and different kinds of you know all that stuff. Banks are collaborating. Oh yeah, on, on and you know like occasionally you hear rumors that like you know Goldman Sachs or somebody else will come out with their own coin and will squash Bitcoin. Oh uh, well, they've uh, there's something called R3. It's a consortium of 35 banks plus IBM, and um, they're using IBM's version of blockchain stuff. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, at this stage, again, I didn't come here to teach you how Bitcoin works. I don't really understand the difference between Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Core and all the other crazy stuff that's going on there and why one faction was DDoSing the other faction's servers. I mean, there's crazy. There are crazy, crazy people in the Bitcoin world, and we should just leave them to rot. Um, but rather that these crypto data structures are super powerful and useful for a lot of applications. We're using them in voting machines. Come see my talk tomorrow and I'll tell you how. You know, there's a lot of value in these structures that has nothing to do with money or currency. <coughs> Shall we take a break? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>